This is bad. Anything to do with black people, you know, you get called a negro, which, by the way, is a very is is now a word that's banned in most places. Yeah, all the girl for that. Girl yeah. is banned. Absolutely. I mean, you can't really say that. It's considered very offensive. But it gets worse. I'm a black nigger. 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 Some people ride their bike to work, others ride the bus. But a quarterly of crusty nut socks found it fit to find an alternative means of transportation. Me, there gotta be an indeed listing for being on foreign. Cause these wake up on my d like they getting paid for it. And of the many videos I've made, the many takes I've took, one video gets me more haters than Jesus himself. The Asia phobia in the black community. I would have never thought that this video I made in my car would be my crank dad. The video that comes to mind when you think of foreign. But of the many criticisms, some warranted and others bigoted, I often get asked about the Indian folk them. Now, given that India is a part of Asia, one would think that that would suffice. In fact, there's something to be said of folks that suggested an Indian anti-blackness video as it insinuates that when one thinks of Asian, you don't think of India. But as I investigated this idea, I found things that kept me up at night. Whether it be my brethren Saji getting vulnerable on how his own family has been impacted by the rigid racial schisms of the Indian caste system. My parents almost couldn't get married. Like my dad's dad almost didn't allow it to happen because of their caste. Or how Alea navigates being black in India. Indian. I walk through the world as somebody who is both Indian, but when people see me, they'll see black and something else. Blackness like supersedes your Indianness. Right, it literally like erases all traces of Asian-ness. Or how racism manifests in religion itself. Indians are so racist, we can't even depict our own gods as black. You have to paint them blue. <laughs> Indians are so racist, we would much rather have aliens be our gods than black people. Or the fact that this is arguably one of the most austere examples of racial and class subjugations you will ever encounter. Such as the fact that this cast the former untouchables and Dravidian Shudras? I cannot emphasize this enough. If you belonged to this Varna or this social cash group, you were deemed as not only untouchable, but unseeable. You were ostracized to work wherever other cast can't see you. And your entire life, from cradle to casket, is colored by an arbitrary hierarchical system brought to you by, you guessed it, the Aryans. Hey, I'm in Dalit. Uh, in India, uh, that is uh, untouchable, former untouchable to be say, the so-called uh, Brahmins and the Kshatriyas or the Orient classes, Orient races, and the dark skinned or uh, uh, excluded to the Dravidian races. Now you may find this hard to believe, but as much as I decry the Maga Sapiens, my most racist incidents have disproportionately involved Indian folk them. That's right, white folks, you get a break today. <laughs> Not really though. <laughs> Many moons ago, I had a friend named Shah. And I just ruined the story because of the fact that I just used my friend in past tense. But I digress. Shah, listen, it, I'm breaking fourth wall here. Shah, if you listen to this, please hit me up. It shouldn't have gone down the way it did. <sighs> Back to Bumbacloud, Iowa. It's my spring semester and I'm about to be homeless. If you recall the last video, I had children of the clan as a roommate. So naturally, I ended my lease after I got out of clan time. Clan time, just left clan time. But my ass was so overjoyed to be alive that I didn't remember to recontract another dorm for the next semester. An island boy like me in Iowa during the coldest winter on record for the last decade? Believe it or not, this is what systemic anti-blackness actually looks like. If I didn't find anything in the next week, I would fulfill the prophecy 
of the racist administration's officer who said I drop out like all the other black kids by the end of freshman year. And I, let me tell you something, my big and beating my big woman them and my big man them, I would rather count every grain of salt in the Morton Salt Company container mining in the Bahamas, by the way. I would rather do that than vindicate Arnold Swatter nigger. So I took a chance and flew from the Bahamas to Iowa with no housing, nothing but the goal to charm the old white lady in the residence hall. Yes, Lord. This was my rocket arrow. So a few shucks and a couple jives later, and Shorty had turned the common area in the dormitory into a room. Only one caveat though. I had three other roommates rather than one. Like they just jam a couple bunk beds in there and call it a day. But Christ is averted, right? Wrong. It soon became apparent that this makeshift dorm room was all minorities. I had a Bosnian roommate, a Mexican roommate, and of course, an Indian roommate. This was more United Nations in this damn room. But it turned out to be an oasis of culture in an austere wasteland of whiteness. Which was a welcome succor, cause as soon as I step out that room, I kid you not, BOOM! I get dazzled by 40 watts of white, otherwise known as Daryl from Newton, Iowa. My eyes! But this kumbaya of cultures would quickly come crashing down when we ordered pizza for the first time. And Shaw walked in that room apoplectic, a vein popping from he temple looking like a crack in the tectonic plates of life. Despite him being brown, he somehow turned red. And my boy say something that would irrevocably change the course of our ephemeral friendship. <clears throat> Nigga, you disgrace my good mother by putting her on pizza? Better. I'm sorry for that Indian rendition. Honestly, this is going to start like a whole new civil diasporic war. I apologize. Please, please don't come for me. Now, personally, I didn't know whether to be shocked, incensed, or scared. Because... While he did drop a hard R just now, I thought I offended this man's whole religion within days of meeting him. So we talked it out. He told me that he couldn't be around beef and I told him that he couldn't say the N-word. I feel like he should have known that. But anyway, peace treaty established and things got along swimmingly for a little bit till midterm break come around and I was about to be alone again. But of course, Shaw asked me to come back with him to meet his parents and get some good Gujarati food. Definitely far safer than going to the Butte. And it ain't like I had nothing to do because, I mean, like I said, I was alone. And guess what? I went. And it was amazing. I stuffed myself up on naan. I had some, some cheese dish, I forget what it's called. I watched bad Bollywood movies. One was so xenophobic that... Honestly, like you just gotta watch this. It's just so I don't understand how this even went to print. I thoroughly enjoyed my time with Shah and his family. So you know that I was crestfallen when this happened. One weekend, in an effort to be cool, we put our large room to use by throwing a party in there. All of the gallum come to play ping pong and listen to vibes cartel. We was the coolest kids in the residence hall that weekend. Our Bosnian roommate brought over some beers, which, I mean, to me, it wasn't a big deal because in the Bahamas, we was drinking as soon as we could see over the bar. However, something wasn't right. Shah was nervous and he expressed how uncomfortable he was about the situation. I told him he had nothing to worry about. And as the party went on, I swear I heard a knock. But I thought that was just the plangent rhythms of Duddy Wine by Tony Marahan. I continued to deliver some jokes and receive some wine. And I saw the door swing open. It's the man. And by the man, I mean the whole monitor. I was baffled. Because they ain't supposed to have a key to this room, right? I mean, you can't just bust up in people them dorm. But this wasn't technically a dorm. It was a den. So Pasalish, our Bosnian roommate, did a baseball dive for the bears like the whole monitor didn't already see them. I did the only thing I could do. Plead the foreign card. I, I put on my thickest accent and say, 
Sorry, man. In my country, it's legal to drink at this age. Had no idea. First week in America, fresh off the boat, my bad blood. Paul Monitor wasn't having it though. My boy say, <clears throat> Ignorance of the law is not innocence of the law. You mean to tell me I had to have the whole monitor that was a criminal justice major? My heart dropped into my ass when the man say he have to escalate this issue to the dean of students. The whole party was shut. The mood was gone. I tell everybody get they out. Oh, till it was just the United Nations. And, you know, by the United Nations, I mean me, Bosnian roommate, my Indian roommate, and my Mexican roommate. And let me tell you something. Nobody was more pissed than Shaw. He walked straight to me, looked me dead in the eye, and said, My dad was right. Never mix with me. Because all they'll do is bring you to jail with them. I was so shocked, I couldn't even retort. My heart was a cocktail of betrayal, confusion, indigestion, and the unique pain that is the loss of innocence to the hereditary weight of anti-blackness. All Pasalish could say was, Damn, you didn't even bring the bears and you got hit with the N-word. Shah never came back to the den. He stayed with a friend until he transferred to another university. And all I had was these pictures that I could look back at with his family. All I could do was think back to Sharon Nan and listening to Chada Bishar Baluma. I wondered how he harbored both realities in him. The one where he is so close to his black roommate that he brings him home to his family. And the other one where he believes that that very black roommate will corrupt him. I had to open all wounds when recording this video because Shah is an ambassador for a much more pernicious problem that isn't unique to the Indian community. But the nuance is that the anti-blackness isn't only between Indians and black people, it's between Indians themselves. It harks back to a long-standing hierarchical history predicated on race and class, and I've had the pleasure of speaking with my learned Indian colleagues to get to the root of the necrophobia in the Indian community. A party one time, and it was like this, like, uh, it was with this, like, Indian association, and it was a bunch of Indian kids, and like, they all said the N-word. Someone in my family wanted to be with somebody black while in Jamaica, and they had to change their name because my family, who was fully Indian, didn't want to be associated with someone black. Many men and women uh, used to, uh, you know, uh, be friends with you on looking out your skin tone first. Then they will look up the social background, whether he belongs to the uh, Brahmin Sudra. Then only they make up a friendship with you. I've been called the N-word before, right? North Indians, oftentimes, they will often use anti-black slurs against South Indians, right? Because of our dark skin. So that's another form of like anti-blackness within the Indian community. The black and brown community yields arguably the most complicated enmity of prejudice amongst intermarginalized social politics I have ever encountered. Whether it be the tacit turbulence between East Asians and Black Americans in LA, or the blurring of boundaries that Bariquins have with Black New Yorkers, the Black and Brown diasporic relationship is complicated, to say the least. South Asian folks have endured anti-Blackness, Asiaphobia, and most specifically, Indophobia, in ways that rival the worst atrocities of race relations. According to the FBI, hate crimes against Sikhs are at their highest level since 2001. Hate crime incidents increased by 82% from 2019 to 2020. That makes them the third most targeted faith community in the United States after Muslims and Jews. But why did hate crimes against Sikhs increase after 2001? They increased because of the influx in hate crimes against Muslims. Because to an ignorant racist, it's not about the religion at all. It's about appearance only. Sikhs are brown. They have long beards and they wear turbans. Despite the fact that Muslim and terrorist are not synonymous, Sikhs who have literally nothing to do with that are targeted because they fit a racist's description of a stereotypical terrorist. Despite this is compounded by the fact that the collective hands of the black community are not clean insofar as we do engage in endophobia and anti-Asian sentiments against Indian folks. 
I'd be remiss not to admit how an overwhelming representation of South Asian anti-blackness is majorly from a particular part of South Asia that has monopolized the narrative of South Asians, especially Indians, in the Western world. Those misconceptions come from Brahmins, because a lot of the Indians that come to the United States are Brahmins. Because they have the funds to even immigrate. CEO of Google, Brahmin. Vivek Ramaswamy, Brahmin. Kamala is... Kamala Harris's mom is a Brahmin. And when acknowledging the parallels between the black and brown struggle with Indian civil rights, such as Babashita Mbeka and the infamous Gandhi, it is clear that there's a distinct racial consciousness and advocacy for our Indian and South Asian brethren that are darker than blue. Black Panther movement in uh, USA, mm -hmm. uh, there is a parallel movement which inspired from Black Panther movement is the Dalit Panthers movement. In fact, my friend Saji made a companion piece to this very video specifically investigating racism that Indians have faced online, which is linked at the end of this video. Don't play with me, watch it after this video. But with that in mind, why does this exist? And why does this exist? Not only did she pretend to be black, but she pretended to be a whitewashed black girl. Like, what was the thought process behind all of this? And she was lip syncing the N-word in songs too. She could have at least pretended to be a whitewashed Indian because she's Indian. All of the comments were saying that she looks full dusty too. Well, dance is far more gray than black and white or black and brown in this cast. I mean, case, okay, I know. I'm, I'm not a dad, at least not yet. I consider myself an Indo-Jamaican Bahamian. My dad's side is Indian. They're Dugla, so they're Black, Indian. My mom is what people will call multi-generational mix, so Black and white, where two or three old people ago, they would have children with and get married to people who are also white or light-skinned or the same complexion to guarantee that they could have similarly <laughs> complexion children, right? Because they knew colorism was a real thing, it was segregated, all of that good stuff. In order to understand how the Indian community exercises anti-blackness towards the black diaspora, it's important to apprehend how many Indians internalize anti-blackness themselves. Q Mindy Kalen. She sort of just has this internalized kind of hatred for, I think, almost herself in a way. Um, and a, a lot of it is shown in her work. Why are you sending me non-English speaking pregnant immigrants with no health insurance? With literally like burkas and stuff. I thought she might be rich with oil money. Well, she wasn't. She was poor with nothing money. I was waiting to shower alone. Because of your weight? What? No. Because of your handsome face? My face is fine. Because of your hairy gorilla. Oh, where you're going, jerk. Oh, <laughs> hey, Fred. Do I know you? It's Velma from Is It Called Rudeness? It is. You're like smart. Oh, wow. Thank you. You're not a compliment. As a South Asian person growing up in America, to see that kind of stuff can be very damaging to my perspective on the world and my perspective on myself. Many folks would have encountered her first from the office, but she's since became an Indian ambassador of the community by way of her many portrayals, as well as her writing herself. The climb for a visibly brown woman from a supporting character on an awkward show to a media mogul is to be marveled. There's a level of contortion that folks of color must conform to in order to gain access to rooms and resources that we were once restricted from as they were white only. The higher you go, the whiter you go. Or the higher you go, the more it snows. It's more than just prosaic adages that I just made up on the spot. They're tacit guidelines that manifest from the rigid beauty standards for folks of color or even how Asians are expected to assimilate, which we can't lie, historically they have done far better than any other minority in America. I mean, do you remember Khan? Khan is a character on King of the Hill and is respective of many social commentaries, but he drips of the model minority myth. He not only exercises it himself to the point where he desires to embody that American dream even more than Hank himself, but he forcibly endows it onto Khan Jr. 
We are a rigid regimen of learning and college application engineering. No degree of white adjacency, skin cream, or proximity will save people of color from the nature of white supremacy and anti-blackness, which Indian folks themselves are subject to no matter what caste they belong to. Being Blasian is honestly to kind of be fetishized at all times on both sides, especially when you're a Blasian woman, because Asian women and black women have two distinct stereotypes mm -hmm. on the fetishization scale. And so Indian women and, and Asian women in general, it's like this idea of softness and real femininity, right? Submissive and quiet. And of course, being Indian, the shy Indian bride, forced marriage, all of that. And then being black, as a black woman, it's your assertive. So many Indians have spoken about fair and lovely, right? Which is like the idea that you need to bleach your skin. I know that when they do makeup and stuff, they still make people, brides and femmes, look much lighter than they are with their foundation. And colorism is still a huge thing in India, especially in like Bollywood. You could look at the actors and you'll be like, mm, it's not giving so much. This word, that word, and also this word, are just three of the many incredibly hurtful half-baked insults that teeter on the edge of becoming slurs. But not just quite. Indians and the wider brown community have been victims of racist white supremacist bigotry for over a century. But despite that experience, their communities struggle with rampant anti-blackness. Last month, I was uh, traveling in the busiest road of uh Delhi. I was just waiting for the bus uh, to travel to my uh, uh, the university. Uh, the one of the cops called me uh, and asked me, "Who are you? Uh, show me your ID card." Uh, then I said, "Why I need to show you your ID card?" Then I just showed without uh, made them touch it. Then I immediately asked them, "Give me your ID card. Who are you?" And there they said that no, you are asking me. How can you ask me? That's what you are asking me in the bus stand. If you see, there are 20, 20, 35 persons. I'm the only doc person inside that in the bus stand. Uh, well, uh, the, they didn't ask for the ID didn't identification of the remaining 19 person. India is known for its diversity, whether that be through the languages, culture, food, dance, or religions. They've traditionally celebrated multiculturalism, but. The concern of anti-black racism is an unaddressed and insidious facet of their society. The roots of anti-black racism in India are multifaceted. Historical factors have contributed to the development of stereotypes and biases affecting darker-skinned Indians and black biracial people in the diaspora, such as colonialism, racial hierarchies from the British Empire, and the debate over Didi's skin color. Yes, they trying to figure out if their gods were in fact dark blue or were they black? <laughs> Comparatively, the black community is simultaneously one of the most accepting, yet also one of the most bigoted, as we do tend to welcome and support non-black people while also throwing around the same problematic terms that white racists do. Tensions between South Asian and black communities have existed for as long as we've shared space, thanks to the negative influence of the British and Dutch colonizers. But it is 2023 and collective responsibility is a thing. And we all have some semblance of how colonialism has impacted our diasporas and what their goals were in creating rifts between communities of color. So why? Why do ethnic groups with comparable historical traumas insist on perpetuating the crabs in the bucket mentality, continually clawing at the ankles of their peers who they assume to be higher on the racial total pole? You're going to have some people that definitely relate more to black people, especially those that are coming from like marginalized caste and South Indians are more likely to relate to black people because oftentimes a lot of anti-black racism is hurled at, you know, Dalits and also at South Indians to a certain degree. Um, so you're going to have people that do sort of sympathize with that a lot, like sympathize with the black struggle a lot more. From what I know about my family caste, like I know my dad's side is very high caste and my mom's side is like the complete opposite. They are like a very low caste, I guess because of their status and like them going to Jamaica and having to live there and then coming to America. Their family is very dark, very, very dark, which is really interesting because my mom is the only one in that family that's super light. 
the only person. Everyone else, like they look black, like they do. And it's super interesting because anyone, like when I was a kid, when I would have friends meet them, they would always ask me like if they're black. The history of anti-blackness within the Asian community is not an isolated tale. It's a story of intersecting identities in a Western ruled world that uses diversity as a tool to perpetuate stereotypes as well as unique spaces for resistance and reconciliation. Dating in India is hard for me. Three, two, one. Oh, wow. <laughs> you need to uh, think yeah. about dating, yeah. Yeah. dating, yeah. dating. So you disagree? Yes. So you find it easy to it's date? It's easy in India. to date. Yeah, of course. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Unearthing the past means that we need to traverse the intricate landscapes of legislation, community activism, cultural expression, and the shared experiences of those within both communities. Picture the steps of the Capitol building in D.C. on January 6, 2021. Connor, Tyler, Tommy, and Hunter, all in attendance, as expected. But who's that over there? Zoom into the background and you get a closer look at the tri-colored flag being proudly hoisted. This brother from another diaspora is Vincent Palatingal, a Virginian businessman who attributed in subsequent interviews his Republican loyalty. Do you even call this loyalty? If you was at January 6th, is that loyalty or is that just sycophants? He attributed it to collectivism, piety, and Indian religious values. What stands out most of all is Vincent's inability to see that his presence does nothing for the Indian community. But it's classic example of the tokenization and the model minority myth in the Asian American psyche. Growing up, I before I could even talk, and while I was learning to talk, I got that I'm going to be a doctor. I have surgeon's hands, so I need to go and be a doctor. I need to be an engineer. My grandmother would be calling me from Jamaica, and she'd be like, hey, how's your grades? Do you want to be a doctor? And I'm like, ma'am, I am seven, and I want to be an astronaut. And so now, here we are internalizing these stereotypes and externalizing it toward the black community and looking for a scapegoat. Indian Americans are but one knot in the fabric of American imperialism and white supremacist class struggle, arriving in the United States for a better shot at fortune, freedom, and success. For Vincent, things become more transparent when you realize that his yearning for a free nation through immigrating is impossible unactualized fantasy. But what Indians and other Asians aspire to is a sense of Aryanness from an American identity and its purported racial solidarity with the white race. What Americans and outsiders generally know is caste. You've probably seen it in like textbooks and stuff. It's this pyramid where it's like you have Brahmins at the top, Kshatriyas in the middle, Vaishyas in the third, and then Shudras at the bottom, right? That's only like the religious prescription for like how caste is supposed to work. The term for that is called Varna. But what Indians understand as caste is this concept called Jadi, which is your clan, it's your lineage. Brahmins are the priests, so the they're the ones that were supposed to be like the ones that monopolized education. The Kshatriyas, their historic job is like kings and warriors. Vaishyas are the Farmers? Merchants, exactly. They're merchants. And Shudras are the laborers, right? And then what we call Dalits, that used to be untouchables, right? They're not actually part of this mm. caste system. They're completely outside of it. Right. They're completely outside of it. They're marginalized from this entirely. Their responsibility was to like clean the house, do day labor stuff, right? But Dalits would not even be allowed in the premises. They would not even be allowed near the complex. Mm -hmm. And it gets crazier because there's a concept of untouchability, but there's an even more extreme version of that called unseeability, which is the concept of there are people considered to be so impure that you can't even look at them. You can't even look at them. So they're only allowed to come out at night. They're only allowed to do their daily business at night. That's how, that's how impure they're considered to be. Oftentimes, 
people that come from lower caste tend to have darker skin. This is India's worst job. These men spend hours a day in India's dirtiest river looking for gold, coins and any other materials that may have dropped from the dead bodies. That's right, dead bodies. The river Ganges is a holy place and many Hindus believe in dipping the dead bodies of relatives for good luck. Because of this, a lot of jewellery often falls into the Ganges and these men will spend hours looking for it. These men will make an average of $2 per day on a really good day. I once assumed that ethnic minorities would instinctively desire cultural exchange and would automatically want solidarity in order to collectively protect ourselves from white supremacy. But I'm constantly proven wrong. Disenfranchised communities in the United States are all about putting us first. And honestly, I get it. Immigrant groups in particular need to develop themselves and create a foothold in their societies as a shelter from forced violent assimilation into whiteness. But there's a bit of a dichotomy here that we're all conditioned to view other minority groups as competition. The Asian American community is particularly susceptible to being used as pawns by white supremacists to maintain the current social stratosphere, which is something we've seen most recently through the affirmative action opposition. When studies and insiders only confessed afterwards that many applicants excelled academically but didn't have a captivating enough essay, extracurriculars, or just their personality. Yes, there's limited resources, but it's not the fault of the black community. This is a great time to pivot to Vijay Shokal Ingram, Mindy Kaling's brother, and yet again, for those of you who don't know who Mindy is, you may recognize her face as a decorated actress, writer, and producer. She's known for The Office, The Mindy Kaling Project, and most recently, Velma. And she's also been heavily criticized for her continuous colorist comments and her self-insert writing style, which tends to focus on Desi women who only date white men. With this in mind, then, it should come as no surprise that Vijay has chronicled how he pretended to be a black man just to get accepted into medical school. He pretended to be black, bro. Like, he shaved his whole head and, like, tried to get into medical school by being black. In the present time, he calls himself a resume writer, and I think he says he's a consultant for students applying to grad school. Like the audacity of you. When you realize that your skin wasn't white enough because you are looking forward to the privilege of whiteness because you thought being in the Ku Klux Kappas, that fraternity you were in, we believe that by being adjacent to whiteness and cozying up to whiteness, it will allow us to have the freedom to be incompetent. So that's what I think he was expecting, right? By being in the fraternity and socializing with these white guys, he could be mediocre. He gets there and he realizes, wait a minute, I'm an Indian man. <laughs> Hold on, you mean to tell me I'm brown all this time? After graduating college in 1998, he realized that his mediocrity and fraternity connections with other presumably white mediocre men weren't enough to grant him admittance, writing, I shaved my head, trimmed my long Indian eyelashes, and applied to medical school as a black man. My change in appearance was so startling that my own fraternity brothers didn't recognize me. Now, not only did he alter his appearance, but he infiltrated an organization for black students and went by his middle name, Jojo, who now describes his job as being a professional resume writer, interview coach, and graduate school application consultant. Now, of course, VJ didn't stop for a minute to use all of his brain cells and think about the drawbacks of blackness and what it means to really be a black man in a white supremacist world in the late 90s. He said that cops harassed me, store clerks accused me of shoplifting, women were either scared of me or couldn't keep their hands off of me, what started as a devious ploy to gain admission to medical school turned into a twisted social experiment. Similarly to the most recent model minority moment from the Asian Canadian student who was the face of the repeal race-based affirmative action hate train, Mindy's brother 
had hoped to silently prove the fallacy of the policy. But instead, he ended up making a complete jackass himself. And just like that kid, he hasn't learned his lesson. Instead, he's using his cognitive dissonance to say that he did what he did because affirmative action destroys the dreams of millions of Indian, Asian, and white American applicants for employment and higher education. His opinion is one of many who all believe that affirmative action perpetuates harmful stereotypes about the academic and professional abilities of black and Latinos who shouldn't need special assistance in order to compete with the other minority groups. And there it is. The belief that you, as a dark-skinned Indian named Vijay Shokal Ingram, would by some means be a contributory member of white society just because you joined the Ku Klux Kappas in university. A spokesperson from St. Louis University rejected his claim by informing the Huffington Post that race never factored into his admission. His MCAT scores and science grade point average met SLU's criteria for admission at that time, and his race or ethnicity did not factor into his acceptance into university. You know, I've like met Indian folks that like talk to me, like pull me aside about and these are like adults <laughs> who like talk to me about how like, oh, like we as Indian people, you know, like worked harder than these other groups, like these, you know, like a, 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 a black people that, that, you know, didn't work as hard and like, but we worked harder to get to where it just shows that it's just work. It's just hard work. And that's the myth. Like, that's what it is. That's the myth. Oh, it's like, do I have an advantage because I'm Asian? Like, am I smarter? Am I like you know, all these things. Um, no, I'm not. Jesus Christ. No, I'm not <laughs> at all. Um, and that was something that like internalized in myself of like, damn, I'm not as smart as these other, these other Indian kids. I'm not a real Indian, you know, like I'm not. And, you know, like, that's not true. I just had like really bad ADHD. I just didn't, I died, you know, the majority of my minorities that come to America, the ones that are able to do it are obviously going to be the ones that are more hardworking because they're willing to come from their home country to America. Like that journey itself. My grandpa like moved here. He moved to Miami on his own at first, lived here on his own for two, two, three years, and then moved and then sent like money back home to India. That's why they're able to be so successful. The last name Sharma. Mm -hmm. You probably already know where I'm going with this. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I had an Indian roommate, he was Punjabi, and another one that was Gujarati. His name was Shah. Oh, oh, yeah, no, okay, no, you didn't have to, okay, you didn't, like, just say Shah, that's enough. Like, I already figured, okay, I already know. Done. Shah Patel, okay, easy, done. Uh, Agnihotri, Sharma, uh, Sharma, these are cast names. These are the names of cast. You've probably heard of people named Sharma, uh, Patel, Menon, so on and so forth. Those are cast names. Those are the names of cast, stereotypically associated with cast. You'll have people, that will literally wear their cast names, Ayer, Zaingar, so on and so forth, as their last name. But then you'll have an entire subsection of India for which their cast name is a slur. Like, the, the name of their cast is a slur. You caught me, you caught me. <laughs> the, the Indian folks and the Asian folks that are able to immigrate from Asia to the United States are the ones that a lot of people are interacting with and getting this understanding of, of anti-blackness or, or just like the way Indianness is. Like we're mm -hmm. getting that from the Indian immigrants, like Indian Americans, mm -hmm. when they are not representative fully of the Indian subcontinent. The average person that is able to immigrate from India to the United States also is a person, an Indian person of a lot more means. And also, yeah. like, understanding how the cast works, like, probably of a higher cast that is able to even get access to means. Like, I also understand, like, your grandfather, um, like, would have worked extremely hard to get to the United States. But I would assume also that, like, his his um, cast, like, and, and his station in in the interpolitics of India also helped him. Yeah, no, you're right. You ain't gonna find that many shrewdras. Yeah, no, yeah. Are the Indian Americans perpetuating a perspective of not only like how Indians feel about other races like black people, but also mm -hmm. like how they feel about themselves, like your Mindy Kalings and whatnot. Like, yeah. are they perpetuating a perspective of Indianness 
that might yeah. not even be in me in this in its own and like yeah. is that then obscuring what is an indian if you get a chance to uh, look at any international students if you ask their social location they are from these uh, majorly brahmin classes because they have a strong social capital and the cultural capital to have this one with the social capital and the cultural capital they have access to an economic capital so with like the affirmative action debacle that occurred right with that canadian asian student but the complaint of people in the asian community and like using black people as a as a reason as to why they're not getting into school or getting accepted to these first rate universities instead of blaming the legacy and like you know they're not partial to students of color already they go toward the black students because we're assumed to be less intelligent people are aware of the barriers that black students face you have to be aware of the barriers that black students face in order to assume that they're going to be less intelligent than you are if they don't know they would think they're equally you know we're matched up that mm-hmm. i have a fair shot and so do you it's a dichotomy you're both black and you're both asian so are they saying that the asian part of you is the only part of you that's smart and that you get your intelligence from being asian you know what i mean and you're severely lacking or you're lacking in intelligence that you would have had if you were fully asian thankfully he nor his siblings a representative of the entire wonderful asian community or their sentiments on blackness but they're not the only type of anti-black Indians in our midst. This the type of Indian dude to not correct you when you ask if he half Latino. The yes. fact you <laughs> confirmed. The fact you have adapted to a cracker's ignorance is a sad fact that we know. You had an entire angle in your battle against Zook calling him anti-black. I thought them raps was heat, bro. Till I heard your song First to Cry, where you literally describe yourself as a sandy knee. Huh? Go, go ahead. Go ahead, say it. You know what I'm saying? You been rapping us wrong so I'm a diss your ass. Next time that your guest this dork's raps remember. He basically thinks being Indians the same as if you're black. He's like, if they can say it, I can say it, right? Hip hop desis are an ography of South Asian Americans who use rap and its culture as an integral part of their identity. The creator of the term N Sharma focuses on the why and how desis choose to assimilate downwards rather than emulating their white counterparts. because they may feel impressed or empowered by the racial pride and unceasing resilience of the black community being black has sort of become something that like a lot of indian kids just try to do because it's like they don't feel safe being themselves embracing hip hop disrupts social division and generates new possibilities for racial consciousness and intercommunity gaps but beyond that folks forget youtube og timothy de la ghetto who while i know he's not indian i know he's thai is but one of the examples of one or more brown or all of in this case all of adjacent maybe skin asians who adorn black culture like a costume to gain notoriety whereas black creators couldn't commodify nor capitalize on their own culture and experience if you don't get your high your keys high's wife looking ass up out here Timothy De La Ghetto, literally harking his name back from the Fresh Prince, Timothy De La Ghetto, was rapping far before Wild and Out, a horrible show by Nick Cannon, who has a breeding kink. Maybe you want to see that video. Let me know if you want to see that video. He had the Monica Traffic as an outlet for his awful rapping pursuits. I'm sorry, I just couldn't help myself, but the man's bars are awful. Booty water. Somebody let me hold a dollar, I got to get in the work. My debit card rejected like I was doing a jerk. My tummy is so hungry, my mind is going berserk as if I can't afford to feed him, my girl won't give me dessert. Much like other YouTube Asian OG, Filthy Frank, who said the N word a plethora of times. Sea turtles are chill. You remember Crush from Finding Nemo? Mhm. It was chill, man. <laughs> as well as rapped as pink guy before ultimately pivoting into a budget brand the weekend without the singing chops or you know the rampant misogyny there are ways of course to pay homage to hip hop by highlighting your influence and using your unique intersections to build upon it such as you know new jbs but y- you wouldn't get me gatekeeping culture like seriously i'm not trying to advocate for people not being able to incorporate hip hop or things that are outside of their culture in their art themselves and it has been throughout history engendering fabulous amalgamations of culture that innovate new feats of the human condition but for the love of jar like 
just don't do it like this. I just want to eat in a leader with a white bitch sniffing on beaver. Are you sure you want to party with the demons? Bitch, looking for a fall like Zed. Don't fly, spit the water, don't see me. Three sticks are pulled up, but I'm leaving. I got a couple pussy niggas in the demons. With a big bitch running, I see you. She said she want more. Unlike his more satirical rap colleagues, Aman Shu from Das Racis, who, despite some of his questionable lyrics, drenched their raps in social commentary, we got people like Nav, who is a different hate crime altogether. We ain't gonna get on Nav case for not having a pulse in performing any of his rap lyrics that rival Plankton's wife for how monotone and robotic they are. But we could get on him for his appropriation of black culture, yes lord. Most notably, his liberal and generous application of the N-word. Yeah, much like Latino rappers also saying the N-word, as much as the word the, Nav is a manifestation of the marginalized myth of permission. Mm, I just came up with that. It's a neologism. I, I could have done better with it, but hey, it's, it's, it's good enough for government work. The marginalized myth of permission being that most folks of one marginalized experience taking their continence and membership of that marginalized group as permission to engage in the reclamation or unique experience of another marginalized group. This was put on full display in my video, When You're Racist But Gay. However, we see it manifest here in Narcos Nav, literally like, like a pulse away from dying Nav, as he essentially sees himself being in community with black folks, or maybe him being brown himself, I don't know. I don't know what possesses someone that is not black to say the N-word. Or even being called the N-word himself by his peers as permission to do it himself as well. There's a lot of these Indian kids kind of like trying to be black in a way um, that is internally anti-black because of the way that they go about it. And a big example of that is Nav. Um, and Nav kind of just like, Nav is very Indian. Nav is very Indian. Like I've seen interviews with him with like Indian people where they interview him about his favorite Indian foods. And like, you know, he talks about his mom and like, he just, he's very Indian and it's great. But then he like says the N word in songs. And it's like, okay, you can't do both. Like you can't have both. Like that's not allowed. In complicated cases such as these, blackness is celebrated through mediums of music, modes, and dress, and aesthetic things, but also denigrated quite literally by utilizing anti-black slurs. But even more subtly, gaining notoriety for the inextricable black experience that Nav performs divorced of blackness. Rap isn't just the oral wallpaper you play to the soundtrack of your first beer pong experience at your house party. It's a concert of black struggle and narrative storytelling. It's black aggression through the tone of the rolling drum machine. And it's black ingenuity via the sampling of songs because we didn't have access to the instrumentation to make them ourselves. The Asian community, can, can, they, they confuse the popularity of black culture with the popularity of black people. And so the people think that because black people and black culture are being consumed, that means that you're liked, you're wanted, you're appreciated, that your contributions to society are valid, but they are absolutely not. I don't begrudge Nav himself as he's but a mascot for a much more massive ma on the face of anti-blackness. Bro, why do so many bloody brown boys the pakistani boys indian boys bangladeshi boys why the hell do so many of them say the n-word why the hell are you saying the n-word you are not bro black bro you do not have any right to say the n-word that is bloody racist a lot of these uh, these brown boys they say they are not racist but they are bloody racist bro you do not need to be saying the n-word in the caribbean we are home to a medley of multicultural experiences some Indians find their way to the Caribbean by more dour means, like indentured servitude, which ironically creates a hierarchy of slavery, where Indian indentured slaves condescend black slaves despite being in a similar dinghy in the sea of slavery. With the jacuzzi social styles of the Caribbean, you can expect anti-blackness and racial aspersions to be coded with humor as well as being far more acceptable in casual conversations than even our white counterparts themselves. Writer Shivani Pasad described her experience with anti-blackness as an Indo-Caribbean person who transitioned to Canada 
I should just say immigrated. Why am I saying transition? Noting that I always knew a certain anti-blackness existed in my family. I am an Indo-Caribbean woman and an immigrant to Canada. My parents had many black friends, even close ones, just like we lived in Trinidad. Still, it was very clear to me that there were limits to these ties. I could not date a black person, for instance. Maybe a white person. Family members would say, I did date a black person for five years, and the racism and anti-blackness on display made me wonder how and why, as Caribbean people, we could so adamantly dismiss even the thought of a black person as one of us. Elders would say, this is how it is back home. We don't like them. They don't like us. That's the way it's always been. In the Caribbean, the Indian and black communities make up the majority of the populations of these nations, with 35% of nationals in Trinidad being able to trace their ancestry to India. Proximity doesn't mean pleasantry, though. Yes, they've participated in cultural events like Carnival, but anti-blackness is rampant within the regional Indo community. American Vice President and, you know, cop, she's a cop, Kamala Harris is a biracial black Indian person of Caribbean descent. For many South Asians in the US, it was a major societal win. A Tamil woman was going to be the next vice president. For others like Pawan Bringa, there's a lingering feeling of an ease. Asians denied VP Harris's biracial identity and what that means for the two communities. Mlinga feels that this should be an opportunity to interrogate and challenge the anti-black racism that permeates American and Indian psyche, especially when the average biracial black Indian is not generally accepted by their own community. But this coincides with an issue that anyone that is local to continental India would tell you. The majority of interactions that Western folks have with Indians, whether that be via media or in person, are disproportionately represented by the upper caste Indians, such as the Brahmins, the Vaishyas, and the Kshatriyas. The very Indian folks that have the resources to immigrate to the States or the UK are the very ones that are not in community with the multitude of Indians that belong to the lower caste, which also happen to be Indians of darker complexion which engender a propensity for the Indians that we in the West encounter to be most likely privileged and also holding the anti-black sentiments that we associate with the entirety of the Indian subcontinent. The Indian culture and values, uh, uh, it's a bullshit. <laughs> they used to call the Sanskrita values and that other thing. It is majorly the caste system. Mm. If we take a pen uh, without the lid, it forms around 85% of the body. These are the Bahujan classes. You know, these are the Bahujan classes. The pen cap is which constitute about 15 percentage of the volume of the uh, the pen. 15 percentage is only constitute about uh, the the Brahmins and the upper caste classes. What happens is this 15 percentage becomes a representative of 100 percentage of uh, the Indians in USA. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. So the 85 percentage of the Indians didn't get represented uh, in, in the USA. <laughs> a lot of Indian Americans in the United States are so starved for representation because we're flooded with like, oh, white people this, white people that, that we don't have anyone that we can really relate to. So then we try and latch on to like, oh, Kamala Harris, even though she's like a neoliberal. If you come from a marginalized caste in India, you're not likely to uh, perpetuate the same like systems of oppression onto other people because you have a, you've built that okay. empathy. So generally the way the anti-blackness works in the Indian American community is it comes from people with a lot of privilege. So people that have already built that privilege back home in India, whose families have built that privilege back home in India, they're the ones that are most likely to perpetuate that over and over and over again. Mm. What you're seeing in America as Indian Americans is a cross section of what India actually is. You are seeing an overrepresentation of upper caste in the United States. Keeping in mind, South Asia has a litany of other countries other than India. And India itself can be likened to Nigeria in how variegated it is. We must try not to monolithize India, much like other races homologize the black diaspora. The Indian narrative may very well have been co-opted by an overrepresentation of small demographics of Indians, Gimindi Kalings, Yaziz and Ansari, and Asan Minaj have lineages that hark to a higher caste. 
one that has historically subjugated other castes, ergo normalizing a rigid hierarchy that still endures to this day. Prejudice isn't one-sided. Many black people view Indian religions like Hinduism as demonic because they go against Christian doctrine. Within the realm of interfaith populations, perceptions of each faith can widely vary. And of course, not all black Christians hold the same view of Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, and Hinduism. This belief can be attributed to the notable contrast in both cultures and religious aspects between these two belief systems, as Hinduism's polytheistic structure characterized by numerous deities and rituals sometimes just seem weird or alien to those who believe in one supreme deity like in Christianity. And that's when the unfamiliar and intimidating leads to misconceptions. So you've probably heard of this notion of vegetarianism, right? Of Indians being vegetarians. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. That is a lie. If you go, if especially in my home state, 98% of the population eats meat. Oh, another a common misconception. Indians don't eat beef. False. We love beef in the South. India, renowned for its diverse tapestry of cultures and ethnicities, has traditionally celebrated its rich multicultural heritage. Yet beneath these vibrant mosaics, there exists a lesser addressed concern anti-black racism. Despite India's intricate history of engagement with different cultures and communities, the prejudice experienced by people of African descent constitutes a disquieting aspect of the nation's social landscape. A particularly villainous legacy from British colonialism, of course, an indentured servitude is the racial hierarchy established to prevent solidarity amongst the enslaved populations of both communities, with Europeans at the pinnacle followed by biracial Indians and then the full-blooded Indians themselves. This totem pole system has detrimental effects on the nation's psyche and persists to this day. Lighter skin is considered as the most beautiful in many ethnic groups despite certain ethnicities being mostly dark skin leading to colorism and the denigration of darker-skinned Indians. With the introduction of indentured servitude, slavery by another name, of course, Indians then used what they were taught to discriminate against African enslaved people within the Caribbean and in the Indian subcontinent. They view uh, the African-Americans or the black folks uh, in India or in the abroad as the same category as an uh, the Dalit classes, mm. the untouchable classes. The African diaspora in India is not a recent phenomenon. Having historically had a presence in the subcontinent and regions like Gujarat and Western Bengal for trade, despite the long-standing history, black people are subject to discriminatory remarks and treatment inclusive of having harmful stereotypes rooted in colonialism thrown at them. Many black individuals note that they've been unfairly considered as being drug dealers, criminals, or simply of a low social standing. They associate blackness with criminality. There is an association in the Indian subcontinent of blackness, Africanness, right? Being associated with being black. And therefore, Africanness and blackness being associated with prostitution. Mm. And so there's like a level of sexualization that really happens real bad with being someone from the Caribbean. Um, and also being somebody who's Indian from the Caribbean, there's a level of like sexualization because of how Caribbean culture is exotified and also demonized. Colorism and racism both manifest differently within the stratosphere of Indian community. From derogatory terms being used to describe black skin to incidents of racial profiling, the discrimination is pervasive. The black students in India have reported facing biases in education institution, and Africans living in the country have experienced huge barriers in housing, employment, and everyday interactions. I mean, let's not forget in 2017, after a teen's drug death was blamed on a Nigerian man, a series of attacks on African students in Greater Noida garnered international attention and sparked multinational dialogue on the treatment of black people in India with the goal of combating racism. And again, I hate that I have to say this, but hashtag not all Indians harbor racist attitudes. 
Some are actively working to address anti-blackness in their communities, and numerous conversations have already begun within the diaspora on the harmful effects of colorism in family dynamics and the caste system. Some community-led organizations and activists have been raising awareness about anti-black racism and advocating for changes in attitudes and, most importantly, policies. The Indian government has taken steps to address the concerns of the African diaspora, such as creating specialized police division to handle issues faced by foreign nationals, which is a pretty big deal in a very conservative country like India, which isn't known for its police compliance with investigations. As mentioned earlier, scholarship from anti-caste advocates mirror much of the civil rights movements and the pan-African upliftment that the black diaspora has employed themselves. Anti-black racism in Indian communities is a complex issue with deep historical roots and it requires awareness, education, and collective action to dismantle the deep-seated discrimination from their previously British past. Diversity, especially inter-diasporic diversity and inter-community mixing should be celebrated efforts to combat racism and it should be an integral part of the Indian and Black journey towards becoming an even more inclusive and tolerant society. Like I said earlier, Saji's video highlights the other side to this coin, which folks like PewDiePie's T-Series Racy Series, where he feuded with the largest Indian channel at that time and was not lacking in anti-South Asian discrimination and remarks and, I mean, just straight up racism, let's be real, which we all know that Felix ain't foreign to. In fact, there's an incident that we all ought know. But if you don't, you probably don't get this picture in the back of me, but <laughs> folks like me that grew up in Halo 2 Xbox servers and chat rooms where N-words were hurled at me for just having a black PFP, or even worlds as devoid of an online experience like Nintendo's Miiverse, was home to harmful racist memes that were the backdrop for my formative years. My upcoming video is a video I wince to make, but must be made. The racism in the gaming community. From gamers to gaming itself, there are explicit to implicit racial aspersions throughout that make what ought be a reprieve from the racist reality of a white supremacist society an extension of said reality. I can't wait for you all to get in on this. I ain't gonna lie, like, I'm really excited about this. But as soon as YouTube frees my video like Young Thug, like damn, I, I swear I could upload a black screen with no audio and I swear it'd still get demonetized. I kid you not. But what if I told you that you could watch this video and more before it even gets on YouTube by subscribing to the smartest service in streaming, Nebula. You get bonus and extended cuts filled with interviews and bonus interviews that get far too spicy for the unseasoned taste buds of YouTube. Like you have like, you know, good old boys saying like, you best get out of here, boy. <laughs> Y'all yes, best get out of here, son. As well as exclusive content from your favorite creators like Skip Intro and Lily Alexander. But beyond liberating yourselves from being subjected to bigoted ads breaking up your leftist agitprop, you get to support independent creators like me as well as supporting your mental at the same damn time. Not only that, you ain't gonna get this in class, but you will get this in a Nebula class, where you could get in-depth expert courses that demystify deep topics like my secrets to Caribbean storytelling, or the source behind making research-heavy history videos with real-time history themselves. You get all that and more when you tap on my link in the description, so what you waiting for? You looking at my beautiful face, eh? Actually, you should also look at Saji's beautiful face in his companion piece, which is a companion piece to this, and also my video on Asiaphobia, which touches on a lot of these themes, but highlights the East Asian experience in particular, with my friend Olivia. Tell him for and send you.